We are live. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our focus online lecture one point seven. And we are on the twenty first session of glaucoma. And today we have with us uh, Professor Keeti Singh, and she's going to talk about steroid induced glaucoma. I request Dr. Vanita Patagre, ma'am, to please introduce Professor Keeti Singh. Thank you very much, Ronika. Um, and as you can see, the photograph there is actually also eye focus uh, for Professor Keeti Singh when the meeting was, had taken place last in person, physically. Uh, of course, we are very fortunate to have her here. Um, she completed uh, her post-graduation from All India Institute of Medical Sciences uh, in 1989 and has been associated with the uh, Department of Ophthalmology of uh, Maulana Azad Medical College in New Delhi for the last 20 years or so. Um, in 1999 itself, she was a recipient of the AIOS Young Ophthalmologist uh, Scholarship. She's also a recipient of the Commonwealth uh, fellowship 2000. She got her FRCS degree in 2000 and a WHO scholarship also in 2010. She's an avid uh, writer. She's authored three books. She's contributed innumerable chapters in books. And of course, she's also published in indexed and non-indexed journals and has presented very widely in national and international conferences. Apart from glaucoma, I know the glaucoma is not her only interest. Apart from glaucoma, she also heads the low vision and contact lens division. And I think she has a textbook in contact lens as well. So uh, with these words, I'd like to invite uh, Professor Keithi Singh to deliver her lecture on glaucomas uh, associated with uh, steroids or steroid-induced glaucomas. You're muted. Yeah, am I? It's it's okay now. Yes, we yes. can. Okay. So at the outset, I'd like to thank iFocus, Dr. Michael Steen, Dr. Santosh, Dr. Vanita, and I have people before me sitting who are my teachers, Dean Dr. Hirsch right there. So forgive me if I stumble because he's bound to catch me at my wrong places, which he always has a very sharp eye for. Thank you, sir, for teaching me so much in glaucoma. And I'm talking about actually one of my favorite subjects because it's something in glaucoma, glaucoma which we can really, really prevent if you all get together. So I'm going to talk about steroid-induced glaucoma, a preventable bane. And as you can see, the picture there is about vernal keratoconjunctivitis or VKC, which is the commonest cause of this because that's the commonest reason why these patients put steroids for a long time. Just let me share with you, I've taken this lecture, a part of it many times, and I was loading my PPT in uh, DOS, at the DOS conference, annual DOS conference in India Habitat in 2017. And if you remember, there's a basement hall where we load our PPTs, and I just showed this picture. And the person who was the audiovisual person, he was the, the smaller ones, not the big fries. He said, ma'am, why are you showing this? And I said, because this is a problem which happens with patients who put these drops. He said, the village I, and this is actually true story total. He says, the village I come from, we have this drop on each of our, our ke every home, home has this because anybody who has a red eye or an itchy eye or a problem, the mother puts one drop. And I did not know that this problem, this drop caused so much problem. There's no, there's no financial interest against Spiderman. The people have made, made a good job of making it available. But because it is so easily available, because it is so reasonably economical or cheap, it's so frequently used that it becomes abused. So talking about that, let's talk about now, steroid-induced glaucoma, what is the actual magnitude? Various population-based studies and hospital-based studies from different parts of India have showed that the prevalence of steroid-induced glaucoma in VKC situations is almost 2.2 from Hyderabad study, 3.3 in the Chitrakoot study, in RP Center study, 4.7, and in the PGI study, it is almost one-fourth of the acquired childhood glaucomas. 
So as you can see by these figures, the magnitude is immense. And most of these, almost all of these patients affected are children. How much of blindness does it cause? 32% bilateral blind by the study from Senthil et al. 34% requiring surgery, which means they had severe glaucoma. 36% blind by the Chitrakoot study by Sen et al. 62% requiring surgery. 37% blind by the Shikha study from RPC. 24% low vision. And mind you, this is permanent irreversible blindness. 45% requiring surgery. From the PGI study by Dr. Savleen, 18% requiring surgery, poor outcome in 20%. So you can see by these figures that it, at least one third of the patients become blind, more than 40 to 50% require surgery. Though childhood blindness has a lower prevalence than adult blindness, in terms, in the terms of blind persons per year, it ranks second after adult cataracts. So we've seen that the magnitude of SIG is tremendous. It's something which is actually made in India and we don't want it to be made in India. How did the journey of SIG start? It came because of McLean and Frankois who reported that the use of ACTH and corticosone made, um, re 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 resulted in a high intraocular pressure way back in 1950, more than 70 years down the line. After that, McLean confirmed that after systemic administration and local cortisone, the pressure rises. However, the milestone which has been most often quoted is by Amelie, Amelie and Becker study who confirmed that in the normal eye and in the glaucomatous uh, eye, the effect of dexamethasone is very different. And they came up with these famous figures of six weeks and four weeks of prior challenge tests with steroids where the final IOP rise was more than less than 20 was the low responders and 20 to 31 was intermediate and more than that was high responders. Um, they did the same thing, but for four weeks and they, he talked about the IOP change from baseline as six, six to 15 and more than 15. So they categorized responders in normal population and in glaucomatous patients as low, intermediate and high. And they found that the IOP response, it was divided into three groups it was 25% of the normal population had a high IOP, but this came out to be 90% in the POG cases and almost 30% in the glaucoma suspects. Now, these studies were done way back, but it has been almost always corroborated that POG patients and the patients at first, the relatives of POG patients have a higher response. At that time, they said it is more in older eyes. However, studies now show that it is a bimodal age distribution with younger patients also at a risk for it. There's something which is new now, it's called a super responders, which happens only in 5% patients, but those five patients, mind you, are enough to cause a sleepless night because they have a rise of more than 10 within two weeks of steroids. So having understood and proven that this steroid-induced glaucoma exists, let's come to what are the risk factors. As we, as Amelie and Becker pointed out, POAG and first degree relatives of open angle glaucoma patients. Age is bimodal, older age and patients to, and children less than six years. In children, the response is much more frequent, more severe, and very often more rapid. The other risk factors are connective tissue disorders, especially rheumatoid arthritis, patients with high myopia. Now here, this is very important because most of these patients nowadays undergo refractive surgery. And post-refractic surgery, the IOP increase is masked because of changed ocular rigidity, thinner corneas, and the fluid interface LASIK, because of LASIK. So therefore, in these patients who are very often high responders and who also are on steroids for a long time, one must keep a high index of suspicion and keep monitoring these refractive surgery patients for any steroid response. Type 1 diabetics, pigment dispersion, angle recession are some other risk factors. What is the cause? The cause is lies in the trabecular meshwork where the lysosomal membrane stabilization by steroids causes the glucoaminoglycosides to accumulate in the trabecular meshwork. The term is termed as biological edema. In addition, steroids inhibit the phagocytic properties of endothelial cells, increase cross linkage of actin meshwork, increase expression of extracellular matrix proteins, namely fibrolectin and elastin. All this increase the resistance of the aqueous outflow. 
In addition, the morphology of trigonal meshwork changes by nuclear size and DNA content alteration. Prostaglandin, prostaglandin synthesis decreases. Again, both of these aspects contribute to impeding outflow. Some aspects of angle closure happens because of crystalline steroid particles of intravenous intravitreal triamcinolone acetate can cause obstruction of the trabecular meshwork. Is there a genetic loci? Yes, there is. There is increased expression of myosinin gene or the tigger induced response at locus GLC1A. However, later studies have said that this may not be so much at a, a problem, more of environmental modulators. However, they have been naysayers because this very famous Schwartz twin study in which they took twin patients with four identical twins who were high responders. One set were both high responders, two were intermediate and none were of low responders. So these were, this is a very interesting study which points to, to some genetic markers. Having found out the risk factors and having found out the, morpho, the, the etiology, let's see now whom in whom all should we anticipate. We know by now that periocular and intravitreal causes more of a steroid responsiveness, more than topical, and systemic comes afterwards, followed by skin top applications or inhaled steroids. Now, the condition in which these steroids are used, the common culprit is vernal keratoconjunctivitis, which is responsible for almost 50-50% of, of SIGs. Uveitis for 25%. In the systemic nephrotic syndrome comes high at 25%. And as we said, intravitreal triamcinolol is again very high up. And we talked about the post-refractive surgeries. Now for asthmatics using inhaled steroids. So remember inhaled steroids are the first line therapy for these children. So you really can't ban them from using it. So we need to find out how it works for SIG aspect. The other aspect which is very often neglected but and it's not very common either is the endogenous steroid induced glaucoma and Cushing syndrome where adrenal hypoplasia adenoma and carcinoma so wherever you can't find this history of topical applications skin applications inhalations obviously not eye drops and ointments look for any endogenous cause and this is one patient in which we had who was a dilemma to us because he came to us with adrenal hypoplasia was suspected because of feminizing features and he developed such a severe steroidinous glaucoma that we had to operate him both eyes. And despite that, he had very poor vision. Now, coming to the common cause is the vernal keratoconjunctivitis. Please remember, 85% of these patients at some point in their life would require steroids. And keeping in mind the Asian Indian climate and ethnicity, which anyway predisposes to VKC being in a tropical country. Many series, one series from North India says that almost 42% of steroid glaucoma of childhood glaucomas is because of VKC. In other studies, it is ranging from 74 to 87%. Overall prevalence, as I showed in the first slide, is 2 to 3% in VKC cases of steroid induced glaucoma. And this glaucoma in VKC is invariably severe because almost 60% patients require surgery in many studies. All forms of, SI of VKC, palpebral, corneal, mixed can cause SIG. SIG is a very fertile, fertile ground in India, it finds, because I don't know if this audible will be audible. No. Is it audible? We can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. No, the audio, the audio clip. I'm talking to a patient. I'll just uh, translate. This patient came to me with her child and she said that somebody gave me this steroid drops, which she showed me. And whenever this child had a problem, I would put. The doctor never told me that it can cause problems. So I've been putting. So Jabbi Aklal Hogai. I would put the straws, which means anytime my child had red eyes or itching, I would put the straw. I never knew it is such a serious thing. So this unregulated medication, habitual self-prescription, over-the-counter availability is the bane of our health system. And because many of these steroid drops have a response within three to six weeks with a mean duration ranging from 
two to three years of use, sometimes within weeks. And even one study from North India reported an eight-year use of a patient who came to them with a steroid-induced glaucoma. A very interesting study from the rural group from the Chitrakoot uh, Center. They found in one 1,423 cases, 3.2 prevalence. Most were young males. The IOP rise was very high, almost 40 millimeters. And they are most, most of the patients were using high-potency steroids. And only nine of these patients were aware of some visual problems because of asymmetry of the disease. And they came to them after a duration of 21 to 24 months, and almost 62% required trabeculectomy. 36% were blind. Cataract also was seen in, 50, in 37%. After stopping this medication, 50% resolved in six months, however, with residual damage. And this has been echoed again by the Hyderabad study, which was just published two years ago. So you can see from this that Again, the propensity of the damage and the young children, 12 to 14 years, your life is just starting. They're not aware that they have this problem. They come to you with blindness and that's it. So it is something which is very horrifying. Please remember these children will live with this blindness for years, will be a financial burden to treat complications. In addition, they will never become able to earn their living. Now, DEXA is so easily available that the maximal retail price is capped by government of India. And this has been reflected by the sale of topical steroids, which is almost twice that of China and 20 times that of USA. And mind you, this is after regulation. Unregulated, it would be much more. The other aspect was depot, depot steroids, which would be IVT or Ozodex. Here, the SIG is pretty much high, 50%. Early happens within four to eight weeks, more after the second injection. And almost two thirds of the patients required IOP reduction treatment. One third needed surgery. The risk factors are more if the baseline IOP is higher. It is a positive family history. The implant position is next to the plas plena or the ciliary body. Water soluble have less of a propensity than the non-water soluble because water soluble get diluted faster. Even posterior subtenon we used to give before in childhood, childhood cataract now is banned because SIG is so common in them. The treatment for IVT or posterior subtenon steroid SIG is you excise the depot, start medical therapy, most of them resolve. If not, you may require trabeculectomy. Laser therapy doesn't work in these patients. The other causes of post-surgical SIG happens in cataract, especially squint surgery, vitroretinal, and keratoplasty. Now, they are confounders in all these surgeries because in keratoplasty, graft size, angle damage, suture-induced angle distortion itself will cause glaucoma. So, so, so much is same is true for complicated cataract, where vitreous or viscoelastics in the AC, trabeculitis or TAS, can again cause increased IOP. Silicon oil in circlage restricting the aqueous flow will be the confounder for VR surgery. Here, there's a caveat. In pseudophagic eyes, the, any intravitreal steroids will cause a faster and more rapid IOP rise because the movement into the anterior chamber is faster. Squint surgery, overtight muscles can also cause IOP, but squint surgery is usually in very young patients, and these patients, children, are at a high risk for cause having hydrogenic glaucoma. What is the time that you look for this glaucoma in surgery? Usually the IOP rise happens in within three to six weeks, very rarely in super responders before two weeks. Especially for strabismus surgery, as I was pointing out, most reports have said that many children, because they are young, they are high responders and they can peak before one week. So please follow them up more stringently. More the dose, longer the duration, more is the IOP rise. With the anti-inflammatory potency, the stronger the steroids, which is beta and DEXA, have a higher potency. Therefore, they have a higher propensity to cause SIG vis-a-vis -vis prednisolone and least is there with chloromethylone and lotiprednisolone. Inhalational routes. Now, again, as I was talking about the asthma children, they very often use steroids as the first line of treatment. The jury is still out for this because some studies have found a dose-related steroid response in 5% of the cases, 16% cataract. Some others have found no correlation. The ICAF study found very minimal correlation. 
so the clinical take is that whenever a child is prescribed steroids the patient must be warned or the, or the parent must be warned that the child must wash and gargle after inhaler use so that it doesn't get absorbed in the systemic circulation and try to use montelukast in high risk situations where there's already steroid responsiveness the other problem which was identified was nephrotic syndrome again it's life saving the steroids are life saving so you have to monitor for ocular complications and stop if it is there or treat the complications because sometimes you really can't stop the steroids skin application again very anecdotal reports in all these there's no confirmed long term studies in any of the skin application applications what is so specific for children as we talked about the previous studies where nine to patients only were aware most children are unaware of the visual loss and when they come to us the ophthalmologist thinks it is pcg or primary congenital glaucoma or juvenile open angle glaucoma and the diagnostic problems are prob are there because corneal thickness is not very easily measurable in small children and very often it is increased repeatable consistent iop measurements may be problematic pre perimetry normative databases lacking so is the same for visual fields and very often almost 28 to 79% as per reports they have mild or moderate posterior subcapsular cataract which makes visual field testing unreliable in uveitic situations iop will fluctuate in in uveitic cases with children if it's an early rise in iop think of sig or trabeculitis so again the clinical take based on these problems is that you have to have a high index of suspicion there's no other way you can pick up this glaucoma in these children So after having understood the VKC is the commonest culprit, then the IVTA, and then some parts of systemic and inhaled steroids may be a cause. Let's understand the treatment algorithm. First, banish the culprit. Stop the steroids wherever possible. Almost fifty percent respond and recover. Wherever possible, substitute with safer NSAIDs, especially for VKC conditions, tricyclosporin, ulopatadine. Tacrolimus has been a, has been actually a boon since it's come up. because it may give so much of relief to the patient without the side effects of the steroids start lubricants wherever possible in future tell the parents inform the parent that they should not use the strong or potent steroids instead wherever required use the milder steroids second is add the anti glaucoma drugs in 81% cases control is possible However, in the Chitrakoot study, they found 64% patients who required surgery. So it varies on the severity of glaucoma. The first line drugs are beta blockers or carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. Try to avoid alpha agonists in young children, and they can also cause more of allergies. So avoid it in VKC patients. Prostaglandins will cause hyperemia and hypertrichosis in children, so they will not be the first line drugs. till the effect wanes off which usually happens over a month you can use oral astrazolomide also now trabeculectomy is required in refractive conditions which has varies as per studies from 18 to 27% to 62% when we do a trab try to stagger from the nasal side because this child is to live long and once the trab fails you will need the other area for the second trab try to operate on a non inflamed eye because if you operate on an inflamed eye the trab is more liable to fail Remember, in these children, because especially VKC children, the conjunctiva is unhealthy. It's a sick conjunctiva, and for glaucomatologists, we know that for a trap to succeed, we need a healthy conjunctiva. So wherever possible, try to make the conjunctiva healthy by lubricants, re uh, replacing the steroids with non-steroidal anti-inflammatory anti agents, and then operating on a quiet eye. Post-op, these children have very often dry eye. You need intensive lubrication. Use steroids for the preventing failure, but keep a track on the IOP rise. If possible, use low potency steroid. Now, having said this, please remember: if you use too much of a low potency, you ultimately need to have anti-fibrotic activity. So, you would need to use steroids sparingly. So, you have to monitor these kids very, very stringently to see whether they are responding to to the steroids post trap. Usually they do not. Once a trap is functioning, the steroid responsiveness aspect comes down because a bypass has been created. But monitor for bleb fibrosis because VKC patients have very early bleb failure. Keep a close vigilance on the bleb. Document the blebs each time. Resort to needling and release of releasable sutures early on. VKC children are rubbers, so with the high chance of bleb dehiscence, 
So in initial first weeks, you can try pad and bandage at night. Now requirement of surgery in, in uh, VKC change is depending on the high presenting IOP and the increased duration of steroid surgery, steroid use. So higher the IOP, longer the duration of steroid use, more of these children are going to require surgery. These are some pictures of how the VKC patients have to be quietened and then operated and the bleb never is very high despite using mitomycin and we use amniotic membrane in our center. Antifibrotic use is a must. You can use mitomycin, amniotic membrane or implant. In very small children, we don't have GA facility each time. Use, I use surrogate releasable polydactyl collecting sutures. The sclera is very often thin. So when you use mitomycin, do the safe technique and do a copious irrigation. Conjunctival healing is poor. Do titrate the fluid egress at the end of the releasable suturing. Do a meticulous closure that goes without saying. Do a blab titration always. And the uh, procedure which we have devised at our center is the conjunctival fill incision. It works really well because the limbal distortion is there in these patients. Remember any care fact which is often there in almost 50% patients can progress and all 27% patients or one at least one fourth would progress. So tell the patient when they are, when tell the parents that when I'm operating this child for a trabeculectomy, this child may require a cataract surgery after two to three years. Like this child had a cataract which progressed and it was handy and was, was a handicap for, for vision and we required a phaco emulsification for this child. This is a brief video on the merits of conjunctival fill incision, which was published uh, this year only. This, this is not a video of a VKC patient, but this is just to show how this frill incision technique spares the limbus and is a very useful technique in trabeculectomy, especially in VKC scenarios where the limbal area is involved. So I've given an incision around 1.5 to 2 millimeters away from the limbus, done the, done the trab as required. And then in the end, I placed amniotic membrane and then I'm just suturing the conjunctiva by a continuous suture. You can use nino. Here I'm using ato nylon. This is removed on the slit lamp after three to four weeks, depending on the healing. And if you can see, there are two releasable sutures right here, and they would be removed depending on the IOP response and the bleb morphology within a period again of two to three weeks. So this is how the frill, frill conjunctival frill suturing looks like. You take up the slack. And at the end, you will titrate and form the blip on the table. So we know that this is a big problem. We know that many of these children require trabeculectomy. We know that many of these children would require a cataract surgery afterwards. We know that many of these children, the traps will fail. They are young children. They have 80 or 70 years to live. We cannot do this to these children. So the best way is to minimize corticosteroid toxicity is by anticipating the site, these problems. Wherever you have, you cannot afford to screen all patients. So short duration, short duration course of steroids, neither is it feasible nor required. But for patients with a POAG history, for high myopes, for diabetics, you need to, these are at risk cases for these patients, if they are put on topical steroids, you would need to screen them more, more frequently any pre-refractive surgery, monitor, rule out, rule out glaucoma, and after surgery, every month, do check the IOP, do check the discs, and do check for glaucoma and other, other ways. Chronic use situations in nephrotic syndrome or in other systemic diseases, try to go for intermittent pulse therapy. And if you're using deposteroids for the retina people, just tell them to measure the baseline IOP. Always measure IOP within one week for all these patients and because the propensity is to happen in six to eight weeks and then at every monthly period. The best way to tell them is whenever you prescribe steroids to a VKC child, 
I tell the mother and I write it in that that these drugs which I'm giving can cause problems. Only give it for one week or ten days because I'm using and I'm telling them that wherever it's written that it's beta methadone or dexamethasone and I write it down for them. Whoever gives it to you, a chemist or any other doctor, tell them I was told that my child can have a problem with this drug. I do not want to use it for my child for longer than required. So once you empower the parent or the caregiver, the problem can be nipped in the bud because the child will never know what's going to happen. The third is wherever you possible substitute for safer options, immunomodulators. Which inhibit T cell and reduce inflammatory cytokines, like tacrolimus, cyclosporin, low potency steroids like lorticinol or formethalon, wherever possible. However, having said that, these steroids do not have that much potency, so they may not work when required for the medication aspect. So just play with them wherever possible. Lifestyle modifications. BKC is worsening all over the country because of pollution changes and because of computer vision syndrome happening. So try to change, have the lifestyle modifications, avoid allergens, appropriate anticipation of the side effects, and keeping the pediatrician in the loop for steroid responsiveness, where they can screen for patients whom they require steroids, like nephrotic syndrome, will go a long way to minimize steroid toxicity. This is a true story of this patient. He, ha I have his permission to give his picture. He says, "Please tell them my story." He came to me with a juvenile upper angle glaucoma. He brought his child who has was suffering from Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, and this child had already become blind in one eye because of steroid responsiveness. This child can't walk. The father carries him, and he was blind in one eye. And I especially wrote that please give steroid sparing drugs wherever possible. This child is a steroid responder. And the pressure is okay in one eye. Please do that. Despite all that, this patient came back to me after two years, and nobody else had even looked at my papers. And he was too scared to show them. He says, "हमने कहा तो था, but they said कुछ नहीं होता." So this is the apathy of many of our friends who don't realize the enormity of what they are doing by giving steroids to these children. Therefore, what I have started in my hospital in Mamsi in a medical college is. Every glaucoma week, World Glaucoma Week, we have either a street play or a role play, and these children now are adept. We have a team who does this role play on steroid-induced glaucoma or the preventable glaucomas, and talk about that these children, when they become the Indian medical graduate, when they become physicians of first contact, they will know not to use steroids or how to use steroids rationally. So this pharmacovigilance is important, and the other thing is, look at this prescription. And I have many such prescriptions. This is one of them. There are so many medications involved in this, and this patient has been again using steroids. There is another reason for using too many drugs. So whenever you are promoting rational prescription, try to educate the students so that it immunize immunizes them against the influences they are likely to encounter in their professional life such as patient pressure drug promotional and irrational irrational prescribing do a drug audit again for my pgs i do a drug audit very often i just pick up randomly sheets from the opd they are not from our hospital but again see the amount of steroids this is a 13 year old child and this child has been on pyrimon for 4 years okay. yes he does require steroids but he also requires to be monitored maybe you need something else for this child and you really can't afford to carry on these drugs because ultimately at the age of 14 15 most vkcs do get burnt out but by that time glaucoma would have burnt off the optic nerve This study by Gupta et al. way back six years ago that 82% patients have been prescribed by steroids at some time on the other, and almost 50% have been on steroids for more than one year. Look at these figures again: young children, five to eight years; nine to twelve; thirteen to sixteen years. The years in which the child is in class eight or nine or ten. Look at the visual acuity in the better eye. This is blind in 22%. Percent. Less than six eighteen, low vision in thirty percent. Visual field, which is tantamount to being blindness. 
So look at this proportion. So we have to stop the indiscriminate sale of topical steroids without prescription, especially by the chemists. And this IADVL task force against topical steroid abuse needs to find more teeth. This increasing tendency of SIG is because of the incidence of atopic conditions and BKC is rising because of environmental challenge. And surprisingly, in this study by RP Center by Shikha et al., Shikha Gupta et al. said that when they did the review, <laughs> that uh, ophthalmologists were responsible for the overprescription of steroids in the majority of children. It wasn't RMPs, it wasn't chemists, it was ophthalmologists. And that's the revealer. So I'll just end again with this slide. See the amount of poor outcome. See the magnitude of blindness. Steroid induced glaucoma is a demon which we have created. It's the shame of our profession. Let's exercise it from our system. Our world is so beautiful. Don't deprive the children from its sight. Thank you. All the questions, please come on with the questions now. Thank you so much. Thank you for your very impassioned plea for, uh, you know, restricting steroids, especially in children. You know, um, it, it has created, you know, almost a pandemic, so to speak, in this country. Um, so um, at this point, I will invite Dr. Harsh and Dr. Pratip for their um, impressions, and then we'll take the questions. So uh, thank you, Kirti. I think that was wonderfully done. And very rightly, as Vanita said, it was very, uh, you were quite passionate about it. And we all have seen and felt extremely, extremely distressed. Yes. And those parents come and the child is literally blind and they start crying. And though you quoted Shikha and all that, and that is fine. But I have seen many a times, it is actually the parents who are at fault. Uh, they have not contacted the doctor back. Doctor has it for some time and they just keep on putting it and without realizing what is going to happen. You, you're quite right. An apathy on the part of the parents as well. Yeah, so it is not only the doctor. It is the thing that they don't want to pay again or something like that and they just will say, no, it's So I think, yes, but there is a fault on, on our part that we have not hammered it in that it will it will cause a problem if we do not uh, stop that. And uh, uh, yes, uh, as far as the skin part was concerned, uh, I have had a couple of patients who were having acne and many of those with psoriasis who had these creams being put and developed uh, this thing. So we like to share other people's this thing. And but I, uh, what is your people's impression? I feel that somewhere our teachings have helped and I, I am seeing lesser patients or maybe I don't know. Oh, so great, great. What is your, uh, maybe you are in a setup where perhaps. We have now come, we have come. We have come and come as soon as we have come. I don't know what is your or Pratih's impression. I feel they have taken on different forms. Yeah, no, even Vanita and uh, is sitting in a, more of an elite area. So I don't think it's, I think. Uh, I'm also seeing, maybe uh, uh, not as much, not but as definitely much. seeing. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Prateen? Yeah, good evening. Yes, you are right, Harsh. Even uh, I feel that the number of patients have reduced. Like, you know, we are seeing less number of uh, less induced glaucoma, less number of acute uh, congestive glaucoma. Yeah. Similarly, now we are seeing less number of stride induced glaucoma as well. Probably the awareness is increasing. Yeah. More and more yeah. ophthalmologists, they are not preferring to write this right. Uh, that's very correct. No, but uh, can I ask a question to Kirti? Yes, Kirti, yes. uh, I'm sorry, you know, my connection was unstable, so I was in and out. So, but uh, I just want to ask you, you know, there is a steroid use and abuse. So obviously abuse should be avoided and where it is mandatory, they have to use it. And if suppose a patient has developed a steroid induced glaucoma, it's a very advanced glaucoma and you want to take him for a surgery. You, you did the trabeculectomy. What would you like to give postoperatively? Because even after the surgery, the topical steroid 
supposed to increase the intraocular pressure yes, you know? sir, it does it does although there have been studies where they they the marked it marked it marked it as the increased post surgery is less than 1 to 2 mm but in my personal experience that's not true having said that sir the conjunctiva is so unhealthy if i don't give steroids it's going to scar down so what am i achieving so i have to play you know both ways so you give steroids for a short term like first two weeks i gave and i monitored them first two weeks now the pressure doesn't rise and it leaves the releasable sutures rapidly the iop rises so that first two three weeks acute phase is done then i try to rapidly taper them off to the lower steroids like promethalon more frequently and i switch to tacrolimus or cyclosporine mostly cyclosporine along with lubricant because cyclosporine causes a lot of burning and dryness and i try to give them systemic avil you know for chlorpheniramine because these children tend to rub their eyes a lot so you have to give them lubricant shades and systemic antihistaminics to prevent the rubbing so wherever possible for the first 2 3 weeks i give steroids because i have to prevent fibrosis and then i taper it off more rapidly than i would for a normal trap and substitute with cyclosporin and lubricant i i have a question here so when you're creating a trap just are you not... sir just a minute what about you sir how do you do it pratik how do you do it how do you do it <laughs> okay you know there, there is a dilemma that's why i ask you i am giving it right definitely yes and uh, i am monitoring them more frequently and uh, i taper them uh, off uh, with this right in uh, just 6 weeks time yeah yeah 4 to 6 weeks that's what i do also but first two weeks normally the iop doesn't rise it happens after two to three weeks if the steroid responsiveness has to come in again unless it's trabismus and a very young patient there it comes faster yeah dr pravani vanita sir i interrupted you no 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 worries my question was very much related to the trab what i i personally believe i don't know what the others believe is that when you are doing a trab you're creating a bypass yes and your trabecular meshwork should not come so much into the equation anymore so even if your pressure rises it should not rise too much and i generally don't tend to believe that it is steroid responsiveness in a trab i unless the contralateral eye pressure goes up does that make sense usually the patients i deal with the type of trab i have done it's never you know it's invariably bilateral you know in when the patients have both eyes involved with the glaucomatous etiology the pathology and no, uh, but you uh, control the pressure yeah if the, if the pressure is controlled in the contralateral eye then unless the pressure goes up in the fellow eye it is a little bit difficult because you're not asking the patients to do uh, nasolacrimal duct duct uh obstruction uh, you, uh, not obstruction uh, you know holding occlusion, the tear duct occlusion, and occlusion. occlusion and things like that when you're giving steroids are you no not really because these children number one can't okay. really do it but i do ask yes. them to wipe the steroids off i tell them use a very clean hanky each time because this will cause depigmentation also so any that is that's a routine for all post op patients i tell them when you put the eye drops post op in any surgery you please wipe off the excess drops but nld occlusion i don't give for these i give for the anti glaucoma medication that do not for post op patients exactly so this this is why i always That's believe a good idea that. i think actually i never thought of this yeah, yeah unless yeah. contralateral it increases i am dealing with a patient right now uh, he is not uh, steroid induced but everyone is questioning steroid induced in the contralateral eye pressure has not increased so i i don't believe it's steroid induced is my pleb which is failing Or the blip I have created, That's which is failing. Saying, so fail you know, much more. No, no, Vanita, one minute. The 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 point that we started off is the steroid going to the uh, uh, NLD and the throat and getting absorbed, and is that and one systemically which yes. is systemically causing a problem, or is it because the systemic steroids the per se cause lesser problem than the topical steroids? No, no, it's about giving steroids topically, which is getting absorbed in the nasal mucosa and acting on the contralateral eye. yeah that is all right but uh, have we ever uh, ever i have never read anywhere that people giving steroids in these situation ask for punctal occlusion are we doing or is it written anywhere no, it's it not. is I'm not it's not but one one can try i don't have so that have, kind so of you have sample. discovered something new okay. today no i do it re- regularly i do it so absolutely regularly 
<laughs> Absolutely. People, People come and tell me it's a steroid. Very interesting. I, yeah. I have really a query on that, Vinita, because whenever you yeah. talked about the steroid responsiveness, the systemic part has come way down and the topical part has come high up. Yeah, that's so right. When we are putting in one eye and we are saying now systemic absorption of the nasal mucosa and then going to the other eye, you know, that systemic absorption of four to five drops a day for post op trabeculectomy. How many times do you I, post I think it's very significant because we are using I will, high potency. I will keep a mind because, as I said, within yeah. two, three weeks, I stopped the steroids post op in trabeculectomy. No, 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 no. Let us check that up. Let us we'll check, check up if there's any uh, 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 contralateral eye available. Uh, this thing, literature on that, and then we can. What? I see, I have not seen a literature, but there was uh, in one of the ICGS meetings in Oman in Muscat 2000, back in 2016, there was after a session, there was a huge discussion on this. And, um, uh, you know, two things seem to be dividing the house. One is whether a trabeculectomy is a true bypass and whether the trab meshwork is coming into play at all after a trabeculectomy and the second part was you know how how whether uh, steroids can act contralateral in the contralateral eye when you give it up yeah, I, I think I let us take the questions because these are high phone okay. things which are not right. for the people so but i have a study that that we shared can with you discuss with with ourselves yeah. talked about the pre and post trab rise the uh, after ivt removal they've talked that the post ivt removal and doing a trab it was just one millimeter difference after putting steroids. I'll just come to, I'll share the study with you. So yeah, sure. That is true, true bypass. But what you are saying, the true bypass is there, but the contralateral eye can be involved. So let's look into that. Yes, yes no. If the contralateral eye pressure increases, then only you yeah, can. I have had several situations where the pressure is controlled in the trab eye, hmm. but contralateral pressure has gone up three, four points. Okay. So from it is from there only that I have you know Part of this. Uh, yes I have uh, formulated this thought process. Anyway, one another very tongue in cheek point I will make with you since How we are such good since, since we are such good friends. You talk about the conjunctival frill. Actually, conjunctival frill was described more than 30, 35 years ago by Professor Alan Crandall. Uh, rest in peace. He expired this year due to uh, poor health. But um, his fellow was Ikemet, and I was Ikemet's fellow. So I've been doing it for 17 years. Great. So nice thing. <laughs> I just reinvented it, maybe. Then. Yeah. And um, I tend to use a 10 0 Vicryl for it. I don't use nylon. Um, and um, yes, it's it's a fantastic. Uh, I, I've um, used it. I've been using it for the last five years. I wasn't trained in it. But I started devised it at last five yeah, I years learned, I've been using it. I learned it in my fellowship as far back as 2005 and I've been great. doing it since then. Um, the greatest advantage of that is you don't get overhanging blebs. You have blebs that stop at the limbus. I think the greatest advantage is the patient comfort is so much more. The tear film stability is there and the yeah. astig is much less. Yeah. So, anyway, so um, the question, sir. Okay, let's take the questions as you. Yes, said. one of the question is that is there any confirmatory test to detect steroid-induced glaucoma? Yes, the steroid challenge test was the confirmatory test where they give a strong potency of steroids for four times a day for four to six weeks, and that's what Amuli and Becker did respectively. But really, nowadays, having done that, it's not ethical to give a confirmatory challenge test you would go on the clinical suspicion because whenever you have a suspicion, you can't say I'm going to put steroids for four times a day and then check for six weeks, was the IOP high or not? It won't be really ethical. But yes, the confirmatory challenge test is to give high potency steroids, namely beta or dexa, four times a day, wait for four to six weeks, it will happen. If there's a high responder or an intermediate responder. Right. Actually, we don't have any uh, further questions. So, are there any? Uh, yeah, yeah, I want to ask. Like to ask yeah. Because I, I, I'm really interested in this. Uh, 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 surprisingly, uh, none of these uh, people who show their traps on this thing, the the big ones, the big guns, have shown the frill. But I really like the concept. Why have they not shifted? Because are they too scared to shift, or they are very happy with what they have? Because this seems like a very good procedure. So my residents now, I've been here for now 24 years. No, no, so my question here. is very clear to you. Don't go so to my, my mind. I'm asking my, they my, 
My residents have all shifted. Last no, no, five, I am not years. asking about your residents, yeah. I am asking about the, oh, the big people. ones. Oh, big ones, so, you should. So, uh, the people who have, who show their traps and all, I've never seen anybody do a. Uh, Vanita, what do you say? I I do. I have been doing it for seventeen years. So uh, when we were in LVP, is anybody? Yes. Uh, yes. I I taught. All my pay, no, no, all no, no. My I'm asking you, in, is anybody else in LVP doing this? Program? Yeah, Nikhil was very interested, huh. but uh, I think there is a little resistance in trying to do anything new. Uh, there, there is no doubt about that. But um, yes, I, I talk about it quite a bit. I published it also in the ITO in 2019 uh, in details how to do that surgery. Um, and um, I find the blood morphology is beautiful. I find that the limbal cells, stem cells are spared. So you have and Kirti, having... what have you published when it was done 33 years ago? What exactly is the change that you people have brought about? So are you asking me or Vanita? Both of you. Sir, I have uh, I devised this in my own way. And uh, so what is the I difference? Said, what is the then difference? I published it. Uh, I published three papers on it already. One was the astigmatism, one was the comfort level, and one was the technique itself. No, he's asking you what is the difference in the technique. I will tell you what the difference in technique. I'll just show you again. See what the difference is basically. You normally do a phonics space or a limbus space. Here no, it's no, a no. marriage. Uh, what Vanita is saying that uh, 33 years ago she was taught. Like no, 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 I wasn't taught 33 years old. No, I was saying, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, I know you are very young. <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> you couldn't have been taught 33 years ago. Maybe you, know, you asked for that. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, God. Uh, so, Vanita, uh, what was the difference between that technique and the technique that you, you people are doing now? That See, I... Um, uh, like I said, the advantage of this technique are several. One is... No, I, I understood all that. I'm uh, only asking what, a very clear question. What uh, is the difference between what you were taught and what you people have published? I was taught only this. My my uh, uh, Dokoma uh, teaching is all from... Uh, okay, fair enough, fair enough. That's what I wanted to ask. And that is why I'm in a position to tell you what is different, what different uh, thing... Uh, Kirti is doing, basic Kirti G is doing, is that she is using 10 0 9 0 nylon. Okay. No, I'm using yes. for different things. I'll talk first to finish uh, and tell you what I'm so doing. So I, I use 10 0 vicryl period. 10 0 vicryl, you know, melts on its own. Don't have to remove it. So by, um, you know, the third week, you don't see it also. And yes, patient comfort is there. I actually increase patient comfort by putting a bandage contact lens also in the patient's side because the patients come from really far and immediately they start calling, this is pricking, that is pricking. So I just put a bandage contact lens also. So, you know, it works beautifully. The um, blood morphology is beautiful. It never overhangs the, con uh, the cornea. It, um, it spares the limbal stem cells. So, you know, uh, uh, you don't get thinning at the limbus. Uh, of course, it's not in 100%. I will say I ma managed to achieve this in 92-95% patients. Some of them do become a little cystic. Some of them, but they never overhang the cornea. This sir, is the project. Uh, what I do differently, sir, is three, four things differently. One is the conjunctival fill is 1.5 to, to 2 mm away. So as she said, limbal stem cells are totally spared. And I don't get the steril flap down. Like the morphine surgery technique, I stop the steril flap also short 1 mm before. So there is, again, the chance of overhanging bleb is less. And when I did give the mitomycin C, I just give the spread posteriorly. I don't go near the limbus at all. So that limbus, that area is the, you know, Lakshman Rekha. I don't touch that 2M, 1.5 mm. I just go posterior. Obviously, some amount of them will leak through. But uh, I don't uh, put it there. And when I do the suturing, I do with 10 uh, I tried Vicryl, although it's expensive for us. And we, our, our, our hospital doesn't support all that. But when I try Vicryl, especially for patients who are uh, problematic limbus areas, sometimes, because our patients and Vinita's patients may be different, there is a gap sometimes. And that time, I don't want to have any problem. So I find 10 or nylon, is, uh, 10 or nylon or 8 or nylon is beautiful. But so they have, but and they have the, no the gap it should actually be less it. with the Vicryl because the Vicryl has more reaction than... Uh, uh, exactly. Uh, it, 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 it has more reaction, bit. but 
the vitreal absorbers absorbs varies depending on the content oh, no no it will never absorb that early yaar come on wait wait no early nahi hota sir but wo irregular hota hai uska for our patients so i prefer nylon one for the cost reasons and second because it is i am more comfortable in the sense i can rely on it more ki wahi par rahegi wo shift nahi karegi vitreal sometimes will will absorb variably depending on the conjunctival health and the tear status and the third thing which i always do is i titrate the bleb once i finish the releasable suturing so at that time if the bleb is no, no, that the rest of all it is the standard that everybody does i was just that's, interested that's, in the field part the rest is everybody is doing that is what i'm doing so i was just because both of you girls are doing that uh, so i was uh, so long before i was like call me a girl I, now yes sir pratip what is opening up over here this this because you know uh, the people there's a question there's a question on youtube can i answer that yes, yes sir, sir, please do i was going to ask you that, you that. let pratik no. first you answer what no 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 what i i am telling you the ah. people who are doing limbal base would continue to do the limbal base the people who are doing the phonics base would continue to do the phonics base you know we we do not have enough evidence about this frill that how much the blep survives a few experienced people are there who says that it works very well so you know uh, okay they probably in the other forum we can discuss it uh, there is one more question you know kirti uh, uh, rodika has put it whether the nebulizer can cause the that's elevation that's exactly what i'm shocking that uh, that's what i said the steroids again we have to remember for nephrotic syndrome or for asthma we really can't afford to withhold steroids because they are life saving and ultimately vision is one part and life is one part having said that yes the some studies have said that budicort and and even uh, the start, the paper from rp center where they've compared the steroids usage over the hospital based study have pointed out to steroid inhalers as the culprit however the icaf study which was the largest study in uk could not find the relevance of budicort or any steroid inhalers buticasone inhalers in causing the iop rise having said that you can't just blame uh, you just can't ban one thing which is going to save the life of the child so when the patient needs a budicort nebulizer for the asthma control it has to be used keeping the pediatrician in the loop that if just monitor for steroids so let the child come to you before the, the high risk ones or every one month first month of budicort if they going to use let them the pediatrician say that this go for iop checking and if they turn out to be responders then you can then you can go for montelukast one third of the patients respond to montelukast and they may not need steroids and go for the proper spacer technique of giving steroids where the systemic absorption is very minimal you will not be able to stop the steroids even if they cause the increase in pressure because it's life saving i hope i've made myself clear so you will substitute yeah. if there's a response you will ask the pediatrician to send the patient for an iop checking routinely after one month of budicort or slash buticasone how many here. pediatricians are actually sending not at all sir when i started this study where this every every year i do this field uh, will the field or the street plays what the psm people who are with me they said we also did not know they send their interns to najafgarh and all the villages they said nobody ever told us that steroids cause this problem and now you are making us aware that awareness is not there even in a college like mulana sir are ye to bahut badi baat hai log diabetes ke liye bhi fundus nahi dikha rahe yaar matlab i think this is actually ab awareness to sir hamara kaam hai bhopu laga ke loudspeaker laga ke sabko sunana hai you see uh, like in rop we made it sure that every nursery knew that if and the trick was that if you would not do that you will be sued people were sued for 2 2 crore rupees when the children went blind because rop was not uh, done by these pediatrician in time sir, why not the same for this so that picture which i showed you of the dushans must the dystrophy child if yeah. i tell you the name of the hospital you'll be zapped no there's no question of name the question is that somebody really takes very intelligent people, people are pasar. still not bothered to understand that sig exists ki ye ek cheez ka naam hai jo steroid ne plug ko main jo okay. diagnose kar diye there is there is a corollary to this now would a nebulizer then be implicated more in cataracts uh, again uh, it has not come up 
and you have yourself the evidence is in front of you asthma is a very common condition in india we see so many children with asthma do you really see so much of cataract it is not actually proven and it's not really there but yes sig does happen in the super responders yeah. therefore what i'm saying is ensure that first month of budicort if that if you're on a long term for 2 3 weeks it doesn't matter but if you're on a long term budicort inhalers after first month of use they have to come for screening right okay and there's another question here what is the cut off for uh, mild moderate and severe steroid responders so as far as amuli and becker's landmark study the amuli was the difference of 6 to 6 to 15 and 6 to 12 and more and the beckers was the 20 30 it was that uh, 15 20 30 that I, that amount of iop which rose to so the cut off always as per glaucoma studies is that more than 6 the difference is you would take it as mild 6 to 12 we take it as intermediate only thing is none of you none of us ever compared know the iop before the steroid started exactly exactly so, so <laughs> therefore moment it crosses 24 to 25 you would say okay warning let's check it out you don't wait for high mid intermediate or low which is respondent so responder right okay i think that's all where the uh, questions are concerned i think the time is also 9 now there some hot seat yes. participants who need to ask questions i was told they you ask them questions <laughs> that was to be done before now <laughs> um, yeah okay. i i just share topical things with them uh, okay after after the um, talk, uh, is talk is over and um, today and i i hope again it will be interesting um We actually thank you, and if you want to uh, say bye bye at this point, we are, we are more than happy to let you go. We are very appreciative of your time, of your effort, and team. Is it a polite way of saying grateful? Uh, get lost, or are you? No, it's up to you. You can stay. <laughs> it's nine o'clock. So I, I, I would like to stay. No, no, okay. how you handle the hot seat? <laughs> great, great. Okay, so here we are. We have, um, yeah. so um i decided to bring up this case uh, i had briefly talked about this case before this is a 19 year old male who first came to me 4 years ago and uh, i was told he has intermediate uveitis and non resolving cystoid ma 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 macular edema and was not on any topical steroids but of course the pressure was up in that eye and uh, was on maximally control uh, you know tolerated medication uh, minus the pg analog of course um, because of the cme in the left eye right eye was uh, he was not on any medication but vision was actually poorer if, if, you know not it was subnormal let me put it that way 2040 and 2060 parts um ac was deep in both eyes lens was clear and uh, aplanation was 13 and 38 um and gonio was open uh, the fundus where the disc is concerned oh where did the disc go just a minute um um oh i think i deleted that anyway the uh, right disc was uh, looked normal from point of view of glaucoma Uh, but it had both discs had baxi pallor with attenuated vessels and peripheral lesions in both eyes no bony spicule but definite peripheral granular lesions now i have not documented uh, his fundus but i have borrowed this picture and this is exactly how his right fundus looks can you see all this uh, granular lesions all around basically this is uh, pigment without pigment so sign pigmento rp sign pigment was basically the uh, and had uh, cme related to uh, rp and so it wasn't actually intermediate uveitis the diagnosis was rp sign pigment with cme now uh, but why did the patient have glaucoma in the left eye only any uh, ideas we have new uh, hot seaters today dr afifa do oh, you like to good. answer that Uh, could you share the first screen, uh, please? Yes. Yeah. Which one? The uh, history? Uh, yes, ma'am. The history part. Okay. Sure. Here we are. What is it you want? Okay, so it wasn't intermediate uveitis. Oh. It wasn't intermediate uveitis. I've 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 changed uh -huh. for you. 
Not sure of it. Hmm? What What do you think? Patient is not on topical steroids. Uh, would you take history of any other type of steroids? Okay, maybe some systemic disease for which he is being treated uh, with systemic steroids or inhalational steroids. Okay. Just stopped. Probably not. Not the, so. He had a, a a trab, and he had a trab with the same uh, frill conjunctival frill um, uh, technique. Then topical steroids. And you can see the you know uh, nice diffuse bleb to this day. He's nineteen. He was nineteen when he came. He's twenty three now. Four years later, his pressure is very well controlled. He's eleven in that eye. But really, examination of that eye showed me this. What can you see now? Can you see something? Can you see something there? These are things that you have to be aware of, and that is how you pick up, you know, uh, uh, these uh, steroid-induced glaucomas. The index of suspicion has to be extremely high. He did not give me any history of injection, and of course, in this day and age, we, we when we ta talk of injections, we usually mean, uh, you know, IV, uh, IVTA, or Ozodex, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Vitriol. We don't really think that it's being done subconjunctival yet this particular patient had subconjunctival depot steroids that's a depot steroid okay and that is the reason why his trab looks so beautiful <laughs> because that depot steroid actually worked and he not only had it superiorly he had it inferiorly Inferior. yes so he could not give me that history that he had an injection perhaps he did not un understand i don't know uh, but he said, Kuch treatment kia. what treatment? He didn't understand. And um, uh, nonetheless, it, that was the culprit for uh, the increased pressure. The, it turned out to be a boon when uh, the, the trap was done simply because it helped to uh, reduce any, uh, you know, any sign of fibrosis. Um, but if the pressure was controlled on topical medication, then the um, the uh, pros the procedure of choice would have been to go, go out and excise these. Not That's why I want to ask you. Didn't you excise this one? There were two of them sitting there. You want to excise one of them at least? Mm, uh, you know, uh, it so it has all disappeared by now. But um, basically, I um, I felt it's 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 not going to uh, make too much of a difference now with the trap. That is why I feel trav is a <laughs> is a is a bypass and not a, uh, not just uh, you know and you know the trabecular meshwork uh, can, may come into play but not so not to such a such a great extent as we put it. If the bleb is at fault, we cannot blame the trap meshwork. That is what I feel. The bleb bleb should be checked. So. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was my bit. Uh, I think we are uh, ten minutes over time now, so I will not ask the other questions that I normally do. I usually give a history and you know show them dis and uh, uh, check with them. Perhaps next time. So the next talk will be uh, by our very own faculty from Kolkata, Dr. Devasish Chakrabarti, and he will talk about uh, glaucomas associated with intraocular hemorrhage. Am I correct, Rolika? Yes. Did I get that right? <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank you so Thank much. You, uh, Thank uh, you for having me here. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you for the iFocus team. Manita, always a pleasure interacting. Take care. Stay safe. Bye.